Alright, next I'm going to talk about my metals that I am using in this lab at the moment. I like to keep bags of my metals because they're convenient to look at and just see what I have and they concentrate all of my samples in one bag, which can be good at times. Alright, so aluminum metal in the bag is a ground up, sanded down to the best of my ability Coke can. It's kind of pure. And I also have some aluminum foil that you can get almost anywhere, which is better. Just don't get the heavy duty stuff because that has impurities in it. And the next bag is of carbon in the graphite form. I got these from a lantern battery that I took apart and extracted the electrodes from. There are four electrodes, each of which contains one carbon thing. My next bag contains crap, magnesium metal. It is from a camping stick after which I have removed the flint from it. It would cost you around $2.95 to get this at Walmart. It's about 30 grams of magnesium. And here is a good amount of zinc metal I got from the same lantern battery I discussed earlier. Each cell contains a thing of zinc. You could beat it down if you wanted to. You could grind it into a powder if you wanted to, which I'm working on here. And next is copper. You can get it from pennies made before 1982, but those are kind of hard to come by, so I bought some copper fittings from a hardware store for around, I'd say, $3 for 200 grams. And finally is lithium metal. This is being kept in a vial under some oil. I got it from a Energizer Ultimate Lithium battery. It was kind of hard to open, so I only got one out of the two samples of lithium but if you add it to water it really is quite spectacular and finally are my chemicals which are less hazardous so I just keep them all together here is copper carbonate I talked about earlier you get it from copper to sulfate and baking soda mixed in stoichiometric amounts and dried filtered here is magnesium sulfate heptahydrate available as Epsom salt almost any pharmacy here is potassium chloride salt substitute, available at grocery stores alongside regular salt for people seeking to lower their intake of sodium. It's potassium chloride. Here is some crap I bought online, hydrazine sulfate. Here is some sodium acetate. I made this from mixing baking soda and the cleaning vinegar I discussed earlier, which is more pure than regular vinegar. I keep it in a glass jar, I'll get to that later. And here is sodium chloride regular table salt. You can get it, again, almost any grocery store or pharmacy. It's best if you get the non-iodized kind, because that doesn't have the impurities associated with the potassium iodide. And here's some mineral oil. I got it from CVS Pharmacy. It's what I use to keep my lithium under oil, as seen here. And other than that, it doesn't really see much use, to be honest. Some other stuff I have in this area for some reason. Coffee filters. Get them from Publix. Get the white kind, because they leave a cleaner filtrate. And some plastic translucent cups got from Publix are being used as way boats. I did not mention the manganese dioxide I got from a lantern battery, along with the zinc and carbon comes with a large amount of manganese dioxide, about 500 grams worth in a lantern battery. I'm in the process of trying to dry this mess after having washed it to get rid of some of the contaminants. It's quite useful as a precursor to other chemicals or as an oxidizer. Time for some additional notes about my equipment. Here is the hot plate I am using. It's quite good. It got it online as a present actually. It's a PS Thermomix, it has stirring and heating. I got stir bars to go along with it, which are stored in water to try and clean them off. And the stirring goes very fast, actually. And the heater gets up to around 300 degrees Celsius, so it's very good as overall use. While we're on the topic of heating, something interesting that I have in my possession is this heat gun. It 
gets to around 550 Celsius on the highest setting, so it gives more heating than the the hot plate, but not so much as a propane torch, which I'm looking to obtain soon. Alright, back into the storeroom. Here's some of the glassware I'm using. Flasks from 25 to 50 to 100 to 250 to, what is this, 500 milliliters to the big honking one liter flask. And in the back of corresponding size is 25 milliliters, 50 milliliters, 100 milliliters, 250 milliliters, 500 and 1000 milliliter beakers. And these are being kept in the same size as each other so I like know what I'm looking at. And here's a volumetric flask, 100 milliliters, here's the same thing. And this is a pretty interesting thing I got. It is a polypropylene based beaker. It is rumored that these are on par with glass beakers when it comes to chemical resistance, but they can't be heated. The advantage is that they're less delicate than glass, so and they're less expensive, so I guess they're worth checking out. And some other stuff I'm using. Here's a graduated cylinder of 10 milliliters. My 100 milliliter size is also somewhere else. And small funnel, large funnel. I use these when I need something that won't contaminate my filtrate. And here's some vials that I will plant that I plan on using to store stuff in later. And here's some eyedroppers. One of them's messed up with manganese dioxide. I'm working on that. And here's a collection of test tubes made from heat resistant glass. And here's a round bottom flask of one thousand milliliter size. Uh, this glassware costed me a total of around seventy dollars in total. And then there's also some other stuff I keep down here. Here's a separatory funnel that wouldn't fit on the upper shelf. And here is, what is this, a test tube holder, I think. And then here is a tongs that you would use to hold something. Here's like heat resistant stuff to get your sample out of an oil bath, for example. And then here's some rings that you would use to attach things to. my stands for holding the assembly. You can do a pretty impressive amount of things with these. Like you can attach those hardware and then just do reactions using these to help. Worth mention are my containers being used as waste. This is a Hawaiian punch bottle that was destined for the recycler so I just picked it up and I'm using it to contain the crap from my experiments. It's relatively inert plastic, so it should be safe for that. After it fills, I leave it outside to do nothing, and then begin transferring waste to this. This is a Publix, previously contained water, but that distilled water has been used in all of my experiments, so it now is a waste beaker, or container, whatever. Alright, this section of the video is really important, so don't gloss over it. This is some safety gear that you will need if you are planning on doing any experimenting. Most important of all is your safety goggles. I plan on upgrading to one that has a head strap around the back here, but any type of eyewear will provide some type of protection. Do not do any type of experiment without eyewear. Next is a face shield that I got from Harbor Freight Tools, I think. This is actually really cheap, but I still wouldn't recommend cheaping out on it. Wear it where there's any danger that something could pop out and like hit you. Here are some safety gloves. Use this when you're dealing with a particularly dangerous chemical, like corrosive acid, etc. And this is a heat resistant glove. If you need to take something that's really hot, like off of a hot plate or something, you can use these gloves to protect yourself. And, of course, there is my lab apron. I bought this from a biodiesel supplier. It didn't cost me too much, and it's very worth wearing. It saves your clothing. And also, it's worth noting that whenever you're doing any lab work, you should wear jeans or some coverall pants that'll protect you, and also closed-toed shoes. 
and if you have all this stuff then you're pretty well protected to be honest do not cheap out on your safety it should go without saying but i'll say it anyway do not emit toxic or corrosive vapors into your living space i take several steps to prevent this whenever i'm doing an experiment this door is closed this fan is on and this window is open that generally gets rid of some of the vapors that enter my workspace so I can say use hydrochloric and acetic acid indoors but for those experiments where I'm expecting to produce a lot of nitrogen dioxide or chlorine gas I have an outdoor table made so I can stand away from it and hence avoid breathing this stuff in it's useful here's a point that most people miss or gloss over when you're storing chemicals, there's a good chance that some of them are going to be of the type that they decompose or something when exposed to heat or light. So something you want to do is keep your storeroom as cool as you can get it and shut off the light and close the door to the storeroom when you're not dealing with them so that your hydrogen peroxide won't decompose as quickly. It's just a point I like to do whenever possible. And finally in conclusion. There are probably other chemicals or materials that it's possible to obtain as a home chemist, but this video focuses on my current inventory rather than the possible inventory. I know it's possible to buy nitric acid online or get like slaked lime from hardware stores, but I don't have them yet and hence will not be showing them. And the final comment of this video will be on my goals for RuneScape. I have runescape membership cards because i actually need them now to play classic my goal is to get 99 prayer on that and be the first to do so legitly thank you for watching